Hi, this is Phil Newman. I'm from Longevity Technology, and I'm joined today by Mike Cope at the Buck Institute from SciClarity. Hey, Mike. Hi. So, Mike, tell me a little bit about uh, your role in the organization. Uh, well, I'm CEO of Corporate Affairs for Cyclarity Therapeutics, and uh, we're a company organized around um, using cyclodextrins as active pharmaceutical ingredients to treat the diseases of aging. Now, the work that you're doing is, is fascinating. We're going to get into that in, in a short while. But uh, let's just talk a little bit about um, why you started. What was your mission and vision when you started this organization with your co-founders? So uh, the mission of our, uh, I can state this in two ways. The mission of Cyclarity, you can state it in, in the short form. We want to save a billion lives and change the way that developers and regulatory agencies treat uh, and work on age-related disease. The longer answer, I think, is that Oki and I have worked together for years in rejuvenation biotechnology, managing various projects, uh, research projects and development projects. And we always knew that atherosclerosis was a special case. Atherosclerosis is by far the world's biggest killer, kills up to 40% of the people, of, of people worldwide, people dying of all causes, including getting hit by buses. And atherosclerosis may be one of those rare situations where an age-related disease is being driven primarily by a single point cause, which is basically the failure of the cardiovascular self-repair system once it gets overloaded uh, with molecules that it can't properly process, the most toxic of which is forms of oxidized cholesterol uh, in the cardiovascular system. So we're going to get into the technology in a short while. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Cyclarity as an organization. Would you say that your company is a, is a platform company? I would say that Cyclarity is a platform company with a strong computational synthetic chemistry platform with one hell of an asset, UDP-003, a primary drug candidate that we hope will reverse atherosclerosis. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the lead candidates because that obviously is a fascinating part of your technology. Of and course. you're focusing on some very exciting uh, science. You're gonna be disrupting a lot of different science. So let's talk about the lead candidate first. Could you maybe just explain a little bit more about sure. that? Sure, the lead is UDP-003. UDP-003 is a dimerized and specially formed cyclodextrin molecule that we created with a combination of computational analysis and some synthetic bench chemistry. The computational analysis allows us to put together a variety of different molecules and test, test them in a virtual world before we spend the time and money that's required in synthetic chemistry to actually put compounds into the bench and actually helps us accelerate the program. The target here is to design a molecule that's very, very specific to oxidize cholesterol over normal cholesterol because oxidized cholesterol is the toxic biomolecule that we're trying to remove from the system. Right, and you're focusing this on atherosclerosis, right? Right. So let's talk about that as a, as a size of market and an, an issue that needs to be dealt with from a societal perspective as well as medical. Well, so fascinating points on both sides of the story. Let's start with your second, uh, your second comment, which is atherosclerosis as, a, as, a, as an issue in itself. Atherosclerosis isn't just the world's biggest killer. It may be one of the few areas where an age-related disease is primarily, do, do, it may be one of the few areas where an age-related disease is primarily driven by a single point cause. In other words, there's a pretty robust cardiovascular self-repair system working in both of us right now. Macrophages being recruited to the site of an injury will pick up detritus and particles and help to clean up your, your arteries. When they get overloaded with cholesterol derivatives that have been oxidized, oxidized cholesterol or oxcol as we call it, um, they, they, they get overloaded in their lysosomes, they can no longer function, and they explode from these healthy firemen cleaning up the cardiovascular system into these arsonists that become these foam cell, sort of quasi-senescent cells that become the necrotic core of an atherosclerotic plaque, triggering all kinds of inflammation responses and eventually leading to the rupture and the event that causes the heart attack or stroke. So we're talking about disease reversal here, which is a fascinating concept, and that's kind of right. flipping a lot of science on its head. So 
Let's just talk about that. Is this disease reversal? This is disease reversal, and this is a good segue into the market conversation as well, because most of what's going on right now is lipid management, amelioration of cholesterol or triglycerides using statins or PCSK9 inhibitors, um, and then fibrates and CETP inhibitors, despite their problems in the clinic and, and in phase four. Um, and all of these are simply designed to control cholesterol levels, to control triglyceride levels. There's nothing here that's actually reaching into what we think is the underlying cause when the cholesterol becomes oxidized and starts to defeat the repair system. So what we want to do is actually work underneath that driver and get that out and allow the cardiovascular system, the repair system, to do its job again. Highly disruptive, though, Mike, isn't it? I mean, conceptually, this is going to be something that's going to flip the industry on its head. Inter you know, interestingly, for lack of a better word, we call it constructively disruptive because there's nothing about this drug that requires an immediate transfer or, or challenge to standard of care. If you're on statins, stay on statins. We'll put you on our drug. We'll look at the ox call. We'll see if we can do something about that. But the statin, but the statin standard of care, the PCS K9 standard of care, does not need to be disrupted in order to do that. So we can be additive in the beginning, and hopefully uh, demonstrate that a reversal approach, as opposed to an amelioration approach, is is going to be much, much more effective in saving lives. So let's talk about what this means for the future. I mean, how will this <clears throat> manifest itself in the care pathway going forward, do you feel? Well, our dream is that what we do is we remove heart attacks and strokes uh, and people living with stroke management and families dealing with grandparents who are disabled by these conditions and people having to live with bypass entirely. Great, Mike. So that sounds fascinating. Now, the size of the market, obviously, is pretty big, right? So you must have a feel for that. Yeah, uh, of course, we think of size of the market in terms of number of lives we can impact right now. Um, the, the market for, for instance, the drug market is one way to look at uh, comparable for cyclarity. And the drug market um, for all of these lipid management techniques is something like $60 billion worldwide. Um, the, I think the better way to look at this economically would be the worldwide cost. The United States costs alone for, for dealing with cardiovascular disease is well over a trillion dollars. And this number is only accelerating. And that's because, in part, we're getting so good at keeping people alive but unhealthy instead of doing something about the underlying conditions that these age-related chronic conditions begin to build up and become very, very expensive. Um, Having a stroke and managing a stroke throughout the rest of your life is much more expensive than just preventing a stroke with a drug, no matter how expensive the drug is. Um, now, worldwide, that means trillions of dollars in healthcare cost savings, but also for us, it means that expanding social burden and family burden that's being represented by that, the trauma that's being represented by that is actually being reduced. So, truly disruptive. Now, you're going to be moving into your next phase <coughs> as an organization. You're moving into your very important clinical stage. So, what's your confidence going into that and what can we expect? This is a, this is a really big time for us. Because of the ILAP program, the Innovative Licensing and Access Pathway program in the United Kingdom, um, we're able to uh, get the uh, advice and assistance of a number of different governmental agencies will be able, we believe, to get into the clinic very, very quickly because of that. We're working on our, uh, we're finalizing our engineering runs right now. We're starting clinical trial material production imminently. Um, we expect to be in the clinic uh, as soon as the middle of next year. That's very exciting. Yeah. And a level of confidence going in, ready to move forward into your phase two? Well, uh, you know, le level of confidence for phase one, I think we're, we're very comfortable. We've done a complete non-GLP safety profile for every aspect of this that we'll have to retest, of course, in the GLP environment or the good laboratory practice environment. We've already studied, we've already started those GLP studies. Um, so far, we have seen nothing that differentiates our special custom engineered cyclodextrin from any normal beta cyclodextrin and those are very very safe uh, they're they're commonly used as pharmaceutical excipients they're great carrier molecules it's one of the reasons why they have such potential as apis 
So phase one, safety, mm -hmm. looking to then obviously migrate into your phase two. So what's the plan now? Well, um, of course, phase one, safety, phase two, dosimetry, that's the classical analysis. Uh, but actually, uh, the MHRA, uh, the, the United Kingdom Regulatory Authority, has actually asked that we include patients with a normal atherosclerotic load in both of these trials. This is extremely good news from our point of view because it means we have a chance to look at impact of our drug in uh, what is essentially, from our point of view, a, a patient population. Nobody with, of course, diagnosed disease or culprit plaques, but even being able to test this in healthy individuals with a significant plaque load give us a chance to see if um, we can do some imaging in these trials and see if we can demonstrate some impact. Now, of course, none of these trials would be designed for a statistical analysis of impact at those stages, but if we have an opportunity to show plaque reduction in either trial, I think at that point, the sky's the limit for us. That sounds fascinating, right? So actually, in your phase one, you're going to be dealing with atherosclerotic patients. Yes, we'll have a number of patients that'll have a, what will be a normal atherosclerotic load for your age. Now, for uh, for uh, current medical practice, that would not be a person with diagnosed disease. But for you and I, of course, in the longevity field, we would recognize that anybody that's building up the damage is leading to that disease eventually, and that's really what our primary interest is. So, Mike, fascinating what you're planning now for your phase one and phase two. What's happening on the corporate side of things? Are you fundraising at the moment, or are you planning to in the future? Yeah, we will be uh, quite soon. We, we, we're we funded in two rounds to about $14 million. That money is quite sufficient to carry us through the IMPD filing, the filing for approval to start your human clinical trials in the United Kingdom, which we'll do about the middle of next year. Um, it won't be enough, however, to go into human cl clinical themselves. Uh, so to run the phase one and the phase two, we'll have to raise in that period about $30 million. Whether we do that in one batch or two remains to be seen. Great, well, Mike, pleasure to meet you today. And obviously the best of uh, luck to your colleagues um, as you move into this very important phase and uh, excited to learn the results when you get there. Thank you so much. We're really looking forward to the next year.